Are they on now? Yeah. Okay. Our daughter was diagnosed with failure to thrive, and then she had uh, a Nissen also with her uh, surfactant with her surfactant deficiency in her in her uh, lungs. She also has a G tube, but how important because. Uh, GI has basically dropped her. Yeah. How important it is it for when she goes to the hospital every month with her to say, where's my GI doctor? How come he's not here? And I do, but pretty much I get told, pretty much it's been fingers pointing back and forth, which I'm sure a lot of parents may have already seen this and expect this, you know, between one doctor going, no, it's this, no, it's this. And then GI pretty much has dropped her off. And last visit, I asked about her G-tube because she's eating orals since December. Yay. She's eating everything by mouth. Um, and we still take Pediasure to help up with her caloric intake. Um, she's 17 months and she's maybe just coming on 20 pounds. Um, and she was born eight pounds, almost six ounces. So we had a huge, we were in almost in the fifth percentile. Um, and then that's when things kind of got the ball rolling. And then, of course, fast forward to now. So our biggest issue is when can we take that G tube out? And I've asked her doctors personally, but when do you guys see? I mean, if they're eating orals, we were told at six months they have to be completely um, G tube, non use of G tube is what we were told from her doctors. Um, and then, like I said, GI, as my husband explained, is pretty much kind of said, oh, you're a patient of ours? <laughs> well, um, I, I can speak to this. I'm not a gastroenterologist, absolutely not, but in my experience at our hospital, um, there are many children who have the G-tubes placed, and as long as there aren't any complications, their formula feeds are managed by their primary care physician and or the dietitian, and they only go to GI for follow-up when there's a problem. Um, and, and, and with regards to when they take the G-tubes out, it really varies. Um, what we like to see is that your child is eating 100% orally and maintaining a good trend on the growth curve yeah. over time, absolutely. Also, all medications orally as well. And then our physicians um, are looking at removing G-tubes at least over a, a winter or a, an RSV season without any illness, or ideally your child has an illness, like a respiratory illness of some kind, and doesn't use the G-tube, and gets over the illness, and doesn't lose weight, and continues to gain. So it's sort of a case by case when they take the G-tube out. Yeah, I think um, uh, another important thing to consider is the underlying disease. So if it's something where I expect them to to potentially have growth problems down the road from worsening lung disease or something along those lines, I may be a little less inclined to take the GT out quickly, um, just out of my own kind of concerns that I may need it uh, uh, later. So. Insurance. Right. Yeah. Uh, because you have to know that, I mean, just speaking from a developmental perspective, you have to maximize nutrition or else... You, you, you jeopardize so much more, you know, medical, physical, but also development of the brain. The first five years are critical for brain development. So you want maximum nutrition. So even if your patients have been completely, you know, eating by mouth, eating completely oral, and medication is all by oral as well, um, you still refer to leave them in as long as possible then, just for the invent yeah. of... Yeah, so that it's a it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, when is the appropriate time to take out that G tube? Yeah. Um, and I I just say that uh, I kind of fall back on a, I, I take it on a case by case basis. So if I feel like I, I feel like you're going to do well, uh, and you can always put a G tube back in if you if you absolutely need to. We don't like to. But, yeah. Um, and lifestyle and parents and and I talk and we we come up with the best solution for the individual family. Generally, mm -hmm. I think six months is probably at least as long as I'd want to make sure that you are maintaining weight. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think there's something back there. Is there any, um, for older kids, like in Alita's case, we, we did not have as many failure to thrive issues. Initially when she was diagnosed, we did. We managed to avoid having the G-tube, but she's a very picky eater. And so in order to supplement her calories, we still give her a lot of milk she still goes to bed at night at three years plus. 
with a sippy cup of milk and most nights wakes up in the middle of the night asking for one. Is there any long-term developmental problems with that? Or is it, I mean, you know, other than the fact that she's, you know, still wetting the bed and that kind of thing because she gets so much milk right before she goes to sleep, which we can totally deal with that. We just, we're wondering, like, are we affecting her development normally because she's still doing sort of younger baby type stuff? That's a really good question. Um, you know, because it's, it, and, I, and I, when I give you the slide and say, here's the, you have to address the medical and nutritional, and then we move on in sequence, it's never like that. It's, it's just like, you know, the growth curve is never smooth. I mean, there's stops and starts. And I would say um, the situation you're describing, first of all, how are her teeth? Because, I mean, is she going to bed without brushing her teeth? That's bad. Because I can, I have some experience with this, <laughs> um, with my one of my children having to have two root canals when she was four. But anyways, so the brushing the teeth before bed and not having anything else after that, you know, is really important. Um, waking up in the middle of the night, um, if she's a normal size for her age, she she shouldn't n need to eat during the night. I mean, that's a general uh, approach or concept for typically developing children. Now, children with illnesses is different, but we do get into a situation where we have what's called a trained night feeder, where she wakes up in the night because she's used to it. But as parents, we're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to withhold food from my child. You know, so, it's, um, so it would be something that I would suggest that you work on it very incrementally, making very small changes a little bit at a time. Um, one of the things we recommend is to um, slowly decrease the amount of fluid that is in the cup. And you can do this by, if it's eight ounces of milk, one, the, one night gives seven ounces until that's been accepted. And, or you can replace the ounce with water and slowly wean down the water. That's an even slower approach um, to where you're not taking it away and making it traumatic, but you're slowly over time making just fairly noticeable changes. It's, it's a kinder, gentler approach. Um, and then the other thing you're going to have to look at is how are you going to replace those calories during the day by... That's, that's the biggest struggle we have. So I mean, she's, it's, it's kind of sad for us that she loves fruit and vegetables, which is great. She eats a ton of them, but we can't get her to eat meat and, do you, you know... Do you add anything to the vegetables? So, so a big pat of butter has a lot of calories. She won't it. eat them that way. She, oh, really? She, she's, I mean, I wish I ate like she did because I wouldn't be as fat as I am. Yeah. You know, I mean. Isn't that always the case? I mean, she <laughs> literally just yeah. raw vegetables, grapes. I mean, eats tomatoes like they're apples kind of thing. You olive know? oil, anything? Because olive oil's got a lot too, so sometimes kids will accept that a little bit easier. Okay. So, so this is this is experience from a, a totally different disease process, cystic fibrosis, and, and we struggle with this a lot um, as pulmonologists. But... Um, and that's actually sometimes where a dietitian can really give you great okay. ways to sneak in calories. Okay. Um, olive oil is actually very high calorie. So if she likes it dipped in olive oil with a little salt on it or something like that, that's great. Okay. And also carnation in the milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of vanilla or chocolate, it's that she'll love it. Yeah. Carnation instant breakfast. Carnation instant yeah. breakfast. The, yeah. Some, I guess the, the, I mean, for her, and I, it sounds like maybe we've got a trained night feeder. I mean, she... It could be. That you you may notice that she 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 may, if you can't make up the calories during the during the day, she may start to lose weight. And if if that's the case, um, she may need the night feed. We we right. do see kids with with lung disease that that need that feed at night, and and that's just the way it okay. is. And and we go on. But the a dietitian or the you know occupational or speech therapist I would recommend seeing a dietitian our dietitian gives a talk called maximizing nutritional density of okay. oral feeds which is if your child's going to take one bite how can we make that one bite have the most calories okay. in it um, yeah and try to brush your teeth yeah we, we do but she always drinks a bottle after so oh, thank you though okay. do you have any suggestions on how to get Arson's nine and he's not like underweight or anything but he's been um, at the same weight for a year and a half now because he had lost 15 pounds when he got sick we're back to where he was two years ago but we aren't moving up any and he's doing supplements two a day but he's kind of getting to that point where he, um, he will say I don't want to eat today <laughs> and he won't eat is, it, for suggestions. Is, it a, is this a new behavior the not wanting to eat today um, 
new in the last few years, probably. I don't know if it's a control thing or, but. <laughs> well, I would say, first of all, rule out any medical issue that might be contributing to that. I mean, that was a discussion to have, at least with the pediatrician or, or one of your specialists to say, is there anything in his medical picture that's come up in the past couple of years? Because he's, he's about to hit puberty in the next few years, which you would expect his appetite to really, really take off, um, if my own experience with teenagers is any. Um, but the other thing is, is it, may, it may be sort of a independence behavior, and uh, I would advise you not to engage in the power struggle, but at the same time, um, there ha he's old enough to where you can say to him, you know, because of your medical condition, that you're expected to eat this many calories a day, and so how you decide to, to address that, you know, he can maybe pick and become an, an active participant in the planning of the meals or buying his own snacks and saying, look, you like these granola bars, but these that are similar have, you know, 50 more calories, so why don't we try these and then I won't be hitting you up to eat so much. We do that a lot with our older children, kind of bring them into the process rather than imposing it upon them. Yeah, and then you can come up with an, a reward system after that. They get a star if they hit, if they hit their mm -hmm. caloric needs that day, and then if you get X amount of stars, you get to go to a movie that you pick or yeah. get something, play on the, you know, with something. So. Or just pay them. Yeah. I'll give you five dollars <laughs> if you eat today. Bribes always work. Well, you, you have to pick what, what works best for your family that's yeah. going to decrease your overall stress. So, you know, if you love to cook and your child loves to cook, that's one way to do it. If not, you know, your child loves money, then you, you know, that's okay too. I um, really struggle. Our one, we need to give her as many calories as possible, but my other two don't need as many calories as possible. And short of being a short order cook for every meal, uh, uh, do you guys have a collection of decent calorie things where you know, short of adding, because we did have olive oil and everything else to it, I just, I really struggle with, you didn't eat all your meat, but you still get ice cream. Like, I know there's got to be better ways than just ice cream, but, you know, how, how do you balance having kids who don't need the extra calories? How old are your kids again? Um, my daughter with lung disease is six, her twin is six, and their brother is 11. Okay, so they're getting to be older, and they're going to school, I assume, yes. So they're starting to get an education in the world that everybody's a little bit different, um, and that we do make special accommodations. Everybody has their something about them. You know, this child plays soccer, and mommy has to leave us to take this child to soccer, you know, just as an example. Um, and so I think it's perfectly okay to start explaining to your children um, that this child needs more calories than, than the other two. So she's going to get french fries or fried potatoes and everyone else is going to get oven roasted potatoes. Because you can almost you know, explain it to them that this is, this is almost like medical treatment for her in order to take these calories in. Um, that, that's what I would advocate, sort of the open, honest approach that you give them the information but at a level that's appropriate for their age. Another option is to just spike her milk, you know, with carnation instant breakfast and they all get white milk and they don't realize. I mean, that, that's one way to do it. Um, uh, of course. Sure. Yeah. Again, there's the, there's the butter, so she gets yeah. a big pat of butter. Right. <laughs> But I don't recommend short order cook, but I, and I don't recommend hiding things and, and, and sort of trying to do this. I just recommend giving the information at the level that's appropriate for their age and saying this is the way it is. If she had some other, you know, other kind of illness and required some other kind of treatment like medication or therapy, you would have to explain it to them as well. Yeah, I guess it's pretty obvious I'm not a cardiologist with all the butter <laughs> recommendations. <huh? laughs> It, yeah. Uh, I think I think we're we're getting the sign yeah, that we I need to, to wrap it up. Okay. Well, I I have some cards I can pass out if anybody has more questions.